have a pitcher of water from the tap drinking from a cup. Fossil fuels will continue to play a leading role. Now, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the day I got out of jail. The Saudi government has condemned a Senate resolution that condemned the Saudi government, specifically Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. In a lengthy statement, the Saudi foreign ministry said the Senate's position was based on, quote, unsubstantiated claims and allegations, and accused the U.S. of interfering with the kingdom's internal affairs. A Russian troll farm's campaign of political memes was bigger than previously thought. Reports by the Senate Intelligence Committee say that after media attention focused on the spread of misinformation on Facebook and Twitter in 2017, the internet research agency pivoted to Instagram, where it resonated with more users than Facebook and Twitter combined. CBS won't be giving former CEO Leslie Moonves his $120 million severance check. The broadcaster's board of directors said it had grounds to terminate for cause because Moonves had willfully failed to cooperate with investigators looking into sexual misconduct allegations against him. Director Comey, the FBI's reputation has taken a big hit over the last year. Do you share any of the responsibility for that? No. The FBI's reputation has taken a big hit because the president of the United States, with his acolytes, has lied about it constantly. And in the face of those lies, a whole lot of good people who watch your network believe that nonsense. That's a tragedy. That will be undone eventually, but that damage has nothing to do with me. This is Mayor Baraka with an important message about your water. The city's water is not contaminated with lead. It is not contaminated with lead. The only high lead readings were taken inside old one and two family homes that have lead pipes leading from the city's pure water source into those homes. The city of Newark has a lead crisis on its hands. Last year, it received a state violation because it exceeded federal lead limits for drinking water. Today, as many as 22,000 homes could be affected. And in recent tests, the water in close to 50% of households tested positive for elevated levels of lead. Good afternoon, Council. See, all y'all got bottled waters up there. Why don't y'all have a pitcher of water from the tap drinking from a cup? Because you know it's not safe. In 2017, a letter was sent out for elevated lead levels. We didn't get that. But then y'all said the water was safe in 2018. You have not been honest. Listen, listen. Ms. Singleton. If you have a lead line, there Officer, are issues. That's why there are initiatives Officer. to replace the lead lines. Ms. Parker. Again, this is not Flint, Michigan. Did any of you receive the robocall from the mayor? Yes. A yes. dozen okay. times. What do you remember days. from that call? It was the water is safe. There's nothing to be worried about. This is not an emergency. Situation. And why do you feel like they're downplaying the issue? Because they don't Listen, work. they help withheld this information right. in 2017 because in 2018 there was an election oh, going on. Right, right, right. And people wanted to get reelected. They didn't want to cause mm -hmm. um, people to start questioning the water. Right. Right. That's so, this administration has a problem with the truth. Do you guys know if you live in an area that is at risk? I do, because they put out a list and it tells you whether you're affected or not. Shakima Thomas lives in Newark with her four-year-old son. Her home gets its water through lead service lines located on her property, which means she owns those pipes too. But the city is legally responsible for making sure its water doesn't cause pipes to corrode. And that's where things went wrong. According to a preliminary report commissioned by the city, a change in pH at one of Newark's treatment plants likely caused some pipes to leach lead starting in 2017. Lead can cause irreversible cognitive damage in children. In October, Shakima received a filter from the city 
but wasn't sure why, since her water test results had been deemed normal the year before. So, Vice News contracted an independent water testing lab to check a sample. I'm concerned about my kid's health. Right now, he's fine, but who knows like what the long-term effects are. I'm just like confused about this whole situation and even like how to move forward. Newark is now being sued by the same NGO that won the Flint lawsuit, in part for failing to notify residents of the threat from lead, something Mayor Ross Baraka denies. I live in the city of Newark. I live in an affected area. My mother lives in the city of Newark. She lives in an affected area. What's being said is that the city deliberately tried to mislead people, which is BS. What happened in Flint was purposeful and deliberate. We, we began giving out filters without people demanding that we do that, right? This is a lead pipe. You may see the little color that's in there. Like a brown color in there. Newark's not alone in dealing with this issue. More than six million homes in the country have lead service lines, which serve up to 22 million people. Despite the risk this outdated infrastructure poses, few cities have opted to remove it. So the reason that so many cities seem to not want to replace those lead service lines and, and to try to do everything they can to avoid that is that a, an economic issue? Is it absolutely is a cost issue. I think in the state of New, New Jersey, you're talking a half a billion dollars alone to get all the lead service lines fixed in the state of New Jersey, period. The fact of the matter is, in all of these cities, old cities in America, we all have the same issues. We all have lead service lines. We all have old infrastructure. A lot of Newark residents want the lead pipes gone. But many care just as much about holding the city accountable for what they say was bad messaging. I've heard from some residents, they feel that the way that the city handled the lead crisis was a cover-up. What's your answer to that? It's crazy and it's uninformed. It's, it's impossible to have a cover-up that we tell people about, right? I, I want to read you something that the city wrote on uh, its Facebook page in, in April of this year. Um, the city wrote that New York's water is absolutely safe to drink. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, if I lived in a household that had a lead service line, by the time it comes out of my tap, that sentence is no longer correct, right? Do you think that would have been confusing? I mean, it's confusing if they didn't continue to read. If it didn't, if it didn't continue to read down where it says if you have a lead service line, then there's a problem. I mean, how many times do you get an email and you read the first line and you stop reading? The water's safe to drink. Cool, I'm good. But you have to read the whole thing. Do you think that maybe that might explain why some people are upset with the city? Were we overzealous in our defense of our water systems? Absolutely, I think that folks in our departments, who, you know, message this stuff, say, listen, our water's always been good. We got the best water in the damn country. We do have a problem with our lead service lines. However, and this is what you need to do to fix that. Shakima received her lead test results at the end of November. Wow. 27.1 parts per billion. Mm-hmm. 27? Yeah. Wow. The water doesn't meet the Environmental Protection Agency's primary health-related drinking water standards. Does that, like, affect you, like, washing dishes or something? Or? I think so. Like, later on, that's the problem. Like, it's kind of like a silent poison. I just got the filter in October late October, so a whole year, I've been exposed to this lead and, and Bryce too. Mm -hmm. So, Bryce. I know. That wailing sound you heard over the weekend, that was the sound of journalists, insurance companies, Republicans, and Democrats coming to the realization that they were going to be forced to deal with Obamacare, again. That's because a federal judge in Texas ruled that part of the Affordable Care Act was unconstitutional. Now you might be thinking, haven't we been through this before? And didn't the Supreme Court already say that the law was constitutional? And didn't Republicans fail to repeal and replace? The amendment's not agreed to. 
And didn't Republicans then go on and on during the midterms about how badly they wanted to protect Americans' health coverage? All true, but opposition to the ACA never went away. This time, the Republican state attorneys general who filed this suit tried a new tactic. They argued that the December 2017 tax cuts rendered the health care law unconstitutional because it eliminated the penalty for not buying health insurance. This is called the mandate, and it was a central part of the ACA. The judge ruled that without it, the law has to be thrown out. The decision will be appealed probably all the way to the Supreme Court. Most legal experts seem to think the law will survive. Either way, nothing about your health insurance is changing now. But the real immediate impact of it is political, and that's not great news for anyone. One thing the midterms proved is that it's no longer a winning strategy for Republicans to just trash Obamacare. Multiple GOP candidates had to promise voters that they would fight to save parts of the law. One of them was Missouri Senator-elect Josh Hawley, who conveniently was also one of the state attorneys general who sued to dismantle the ACA. Like. I'm Josh Hawley. I support forcing insurance companies to cover all pre-existing conditions. When the ruling came down over the weekend, President Trump celebrated, but very few other Republicans joined him. Instead, they tried a more measured approach. Just for America, it means we're gonna to continue to debate this. Healthcare clearly matters to people. Democrats are preparing to pounce, and they're hoping to force congressional Republicans to vote on joining them in defending the law in court. But the ruling isn't actually great for Democrats either, because it may push them to pick sides way sooner than they wanted to in the polarizing internal debate about government-funded healthcare, so-called Medicare for All, which is already creating some discomfort for potential 2020 challengers. Former Attorney General Eric Holder says it's time now to move to some version of Medicare for All and end this nonsense. That was his reaction to Friday's ruling. Do you agree with him? We need universal health care, and there are many ways to get there. That is one of them. The other is to at least expand Medicare to age 55. So, ambitious Democrats are worried. Republicans are really worried. That leaves one group that hates the ruling while still seeing an opportunity in it. Progressives, who know they want Medicare for all to be a thing. Michigan Congresswoman Debbie Dingell is one of them. You don't give up. You don't say it's impossible. You keep talking to people about what it is. And eventually, you build that grassroots movement that will get us Medicare for all. Democrats have done a really good job lately ignoring their differences and focusing on their common enemy, President Donald Trump. The healthcare issue, which helped them so much in the midterms, could be what strains their unity in 2020. And Dingle seems fine with that. We don't have a presidential candidate that's willing to talk about universal health care, that every American's got a right to affordable quality health care. That, that's not someone I want to see be president of the United States. The goal of this year's UN Climate Conference, known as COP, was to sort how countries will track and report their emissions under the Paris Agreement. And as of this Saturday, they accomplished that, with over 200 countries agreeing to emissions reductions guidelines. But it was a sideshow of climate skeptics, not the negotiations themselves, that stole the spotlight for much of the conference. Fossil fuels will continue to play a leading role. <laughs> Energy access with protesters interrupting a pro-coal forum sponsored by Australia and the U.S. Poland hosted the meeting in a coal town and even decorated the meeting space with actual pieces of coal. The stunt drew attention and reminded the world that coal-fired power plants still generate 80% of Poland's electricity. But Poland is in the EU, and the EU gives Poland roughly 12 billion euros a year. So it's unlikely to go against the EU's plan to go carbon neutral by 2050. But a number of other countries showed that they're willing to publicly bash the goals of the agreement. Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Australia were all reluctant adopters of the pact in the first place. Together, they produce 7.5% of the world's carbon emissions, and they've leaned even further into their holdout position this year. Australia, for instance, was the only country that joined the U.S. for its now annual pro-coal side event. And their ambassador for the environment even had a little American flag on his nameplate. Russia and Saudi Arabia both joined forces with Kuwait and the U.S. in an attempt to block a formal welcoming of the latest IPCC report. Instead, 
they proposed to simply note the report's findings, a move highlighting their suspicion of climate science. Outside the negotiations, Brazil is another big polluter to watch. Newly elected President Bolsonaro has said he wants to leave the Paris Agreement, like President Trump did, and canceled the government's previous commitment to host next year's talks. But despite these countries' behavior, they'll likely continue to participate, and the U.S. still sent a delegation this year. Why? Because the most polluting countries want to keep the playing field even, making sure that other countries don't get a leg up. Miami just hosted its 17th annual Art Week, but you might know it better by the name Art Basel, Art Week's most popular affair. Along with yielding millions of dollars in sales, the scene here is guaranteed Instagram bait. But this year, Instagrammers weren't just documenting the art, they were making it. We're working on the screens to get like a, his photo there and then like a loop of the video. Hijar Benjida is a photography student from the Netherlands. She's also the creator of a viral Instagram account that pays homage to her favorite artist, Young Thug, the Atlanta rapper who's collaborated with Drake, Kanye West, and Camila Cabello. So how did this all start? First, it started out as a school project. I had a lot of photos of Thug, like funny photos, like people would use as reaction photos or stuff like that. Saved on your phone? Yeah, or just based off his Instagram. It's called Young Thug is Paintings, and the concept is simple. Benjita matches photos of Thug alongside similar-looking classical paintings. The project made its real-world debut in Miami. How did this one come together? I think I saw the painting on an art block, and I just I remembered this photo of him. The exhibit's unique for a couple reasons. Out of the 1,300-plus exhibitions that make it to Miami Art Week, the majority are sponsored by galleries. But Young Thug's paintings has no curatorial backing. Also, it's super rare to be able to touch the art. You're allowed to take them with you. That's why we have a lot. Take them with you? Yeah, you're allowed like, to like, bring a set with you. I can have one? Yeah. Wow. It's very accessible. Like You don't even have to know him. But people get to know about him. People get to know about historical art. It's basically the best case scenario for fan art. What Benjita lacked in traditional gallery support, she made up for with over 63,000 followers and the help of Young Thug's record label putting the exhibit together. Would you consider the Young Thug as paintings exhibit sort of an outlier within this whole In setup? our world, no. Okay. In the rest of the art industry, perhaps, yeah. I'm Alexis Hubschman is the founder and president of Scope Art Show. And apparently, he saw something the other fairs didn't. What about that project piqued your interest? That Anyone has access to it. That's kind of what we love about the fair in, in general, is that people, we kind of demystify the white box. We kind of try to work with projects that are reaching a larger population than just cold, austere German collector population. You know, not to disrespect that, but, sure. but there is something we prefer when it's a little bit of a larger inclusion. Was the fact that it already has a following and that Young Thug has a following a factor at all? Everything's a factor. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a merchant at the end of the day, so I won't pretend it's all, you know, flowers and farting unicorns. Had it had no following, I wouldn't have thought twice. I'd still be doing it. But it does have a following. And coaxing a famous rapper to your event is great marketing. That's him. Can you record, like, everything? Yes. Yeah. Yonta, Amajar, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for this. Thank you so much for coming. You know all this stuff. It's just a lot of like going through art blogs and I was really good in art history. So I just started finding like similarities between your photos. You should hold that one in the light. This one? Yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been following the Instagram for a while, but how does it feel to see it all here 
in real life. It feels dope. It feels, it feels amazing because it's like the way the way it's put together. That takes time. Not even the time that takes, but to come to understand that images that were taken of you without even thinking about it match up yeah, so well. Yeah, that's weird. Art. That's what's weird. That's weird. That's the weird part. <laughs> I, I pose like history people. <laughs> Do you have a favorite one? Yes. Yeah. This one, Man and Boy yeah, in this Algiers. This one I've seen too. Yeah. Why is that your favorite? Now, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the day I got out of jail. Turn negative into positive. See it? 